Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Coaching and Consulting Insight Series on the Success Insight Podcast. The Coaching and Consulting Insight Series introduces you to coaches and consultants that work with professionals, managers, leaders, and organizations to perform at their full potential. Our guest today is Sam Thiara. Sam is a coach, speaker, lecturer, entrepreneur. He's the founder and chief motivating officer at Ignite the Dream Coaching and Consulting, a platform that engages his audience to define their path. He's a lecturer at the Beatty School of Business at Simon Fraser University. He has two TED Talks under his belt, and he's the author of Lost and Found, Seeking the Past, and finding myself. Sam, welcome to the Coaching and Consulting Insight Series on the Success Insight Podcast. Howard, thank you for having me. And I look forward to being able to share insights and stories and hopefully some nuggets for your listeners. Fantastic. I have no doubt about that. And, and I have to share, Sam, as I was prepping the show notes, you know, I go out to your website, I went to the Amazon to check out the book. And then I, you know, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, this is a busy guy. I mean, teaching, authoring TED Talks and running the business is quite a bit. Well, and I guess the way I look at it is I like to create my own busy because when you create your own busy, no one can impose their busy on you. Well, except my wife, maybe when it comes to housework, but I'm busy. I'm sorry. I'd like to clean up, but yeah, no, I create my own busy, but it's always things that I really enjoy doing. Well, and that's actually what comes across to as and as I'm doing the research is you really enjoy the work that you do. And that is, I, I would like to think we see that, but I, I also think we don't often see that. You know, and the way that this happened for me is, you know, I was down a regular corporate road and the way I like to describe, and you'll see that I'm all, all about acronyms and analogies is, I was wearing a 52 short suit and I'm a 42 regular. I could wear this suit, but it just didn't fit. So when I was in the corporate job, I could do it, but it just wasn't right. And then I thought, you know what, I'm going to come up with a tailored solution. And I started looking at not what I was doing, but who am I? And the moment I started focusing on who I am, clarity emerged. And it suddenly made me realize that that corporate job was not the place I needed to be. I needed to expand and expose myself to another area. And it turned out uh, that the next jump I did, which in my corporate job was working in claims and I could do it, but it wasn't me. But when I moved over to road safety and learned about it from the point of having no experience, it just fit perfectly. But even after that, and all the other things I've gotten to do, it all has to align with who I am. And the simple way for me to describe this and to help your audience in this as well, because this was imposed upon me, but now I mentor and coach others in this, and I call it the five core elements. I sat down and I thought to myself, when I was in that corporate job that didn't fit, what are the five things that are really important to me that I'm not willing to compromise in life and career, not career, but life and career. Sure. And you know what? Once I nailed down these five things, it guided me to where I needed to go, which was in this community relations road safety area. And it's carried me forward to the point where, and I've changed them over the years as I've been in different positions in different areas. So the five things that I am not willing to compromise in my life right now, servant leadership, story sharing, activator igniter, champion enabler, and community do-gooder. I've got about 12 projects I'm working on right now. All 12 hit five out of five, but they're also not separate. Like, in other words, it's not like I'm doing pharmaceutical and finance and yoga and those are the, like, they actually layer in, like my speaking layers into my storytelling, which layers into my education, which layers into the mentorship and coaching. But the moment I started looking at it from the five, 
clarity happened. When you take on clients in the, the your yep. coaching uh, practice, do you kind of evaluate the the nature of the p- potential work against mm-hmm. the these core elements before you say yes, I'll do it or mm-hmm. no, this is probably not a good fit. Oh no, it, it, the people who come to me, they they know what they're expecting, and it's okay. more of the of the area that I look at is they're on a train, but they're probably not on the right train, and what they're looking for is because they're focused on a destination, they're focused on you know the the journey towards the promotion or any number of things, but the journey is the most important part. And we start talking and I start focusing on, but who are you? So we start working on that and we start working on what we call the five core elements. And then people start getting this clarity and they're like, either it, I can see that this is what I should do, but I'm missing a couple of things. And I think this is what might help to Oh, I'm totally in the wrong area and I need to change trains and get at the get off at the next stop. It's almost like I've never turned down anybody and it's been about 5,000 conversations to date. Now, to be fair, many of them are could be one-offs or I don't use a structured process in, the, in this. In other words, you and I may have a conversation today and I don't say, okay, now two weeks from now, you will re- reply back to me with your five core elements. I leave that up to the person to say, okay, I'm ready to come back now. And that's how I do my conversations very organic. And Howard, I think when I first meet people, the first question I always ask is, what would you like to talk about today? And then I'm able to guide and structure the conversation based on where they need to be or where they would like the conversation to go. So I I carry it that way. Who are the the types of clients that come to you for your 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 aid, your coaching? I mean, what what are, if, is there an age, a demographic, profession? Yep, uh, I mean, primarily, it's fifteen to forty year olds, and part of the reason being is because I teach in university, and when I teach, then all of a sudden they're still staying connected. But what's interesting about this journey is they graduate, but they're still connected to me. And it also turns out that, I mean, I've, I've worked with people that are like 15 years old, all the way to CEOs and companies, but predominantly it's 15 to 40 year olds. And I would say even more refined, it would be the university post-secondary individual graduating. And then for, you know, until they turn 40 approximately. And I wrote a blog post, which was had to do have to do, want to do. I mean, think of it this way, Howard, the first job out of university, corporate culture, pay, benefits, none of this is going to matter. I need a job. And that's what I had to do. I took whatever I could do just to get something. But then I'm having conversations with them five to 10 years, maybe even 15 years out. What do I have to do to get to my want to do? And it always starts out the same way. Sam, we haven't talked in so long. How are you doing? How's the family keeping? Let's go grab coffee. And when we grab coffee, the conversation starts going, yeah, no, I just thought haven't caught up in this. And then my question is, how are things? How are you doing? I'm doing good. But, and then once that but hits, then it's like, okay, now we know where this conversation is going. And then we go into this, Okay, let's talk about this. Tell me about where you are in life. Tell me about what's important to you. And we start going down that cycle. So I think what I try to do is keep it very authentic, very genuine, but always a conversation. And there's no there's no pressure or structure in that regard. And I think it really helps that individual because they know that it's in a safe place. They know that they can have a conversation and, you know, feel like that they're actually on a journey now. Very good. And mm-hmm. thinking about the, this journey, your own journey, I mean, you were, you're, you had this career, you were, you know, this feeling of something's just not right. Yep. And you, you had this discovery. When did you begin to formalize it into like, mm-hmm. and discover coaching? And what, mm-hmm. what did that yep. piece of the journey look like for you? 
actually a lot of what happens in my life, like I never, it was never a goal of mine to be a coach. It was never a goal of mine to teach at university, to be an author. Any number of these things were never goals that I've set. I think the biggest part of this is you can always reflect back. And the key thing is you don't dwell on the back on what happened in the past, but you reflect on it. And those things that I reflect on carries me to who I am today. For example, when I graduated from university, you had this idea that, you know, I'm graduating with a degree in political science, well, business and political science, and that's a great combination. I mean, who's lucky to get me? Well, you start applying for jobs. And I remember I sent out about 12 letters sitting back waiting for somebody to reply back saying okay you are the one and I was like okay we'll see I mean I'll decide which company to go with once those letters arrive and two weeks later a letter arrived opened it up and it was a company I applied for and they said well sorry we don't have a job we're not sure what you're looking for but good luck and I thought that's okay I got 11 letters out there I'll send three more out somebody's going to be lucky and it was like the tide, the more letters I sent out, the more rejections came back. And I wound up with 86 rejection letters, 86. And, it's 86. and it's almost the size of like a brick when you hold it in your hand, probably as heavy as that. I don't know why I kept the letters, but they kept coming in and every letter became a nail in my coffin of self-confidence. But it also told me I wasn't ready. It told me that my vision was who's lucky to get me had switched to, am I lucky to get a job? But Howard, I did get my first job. And if finally, after 86 rejections, and it was an entry level government job, I was a janitor in a hospital, mopping floors and emptying rubbish bins with a degree on my wall. But this is where that reflection comes in. Because instead of looking at this as a negative, I said, no, I am not gonna be pulled into this vortex of negativity. Three life lessons emerged that carries me to who I am today. The first lesson, my father said, I don't care what you do. You do the best job possible because you know what? Your reputation is on the line. And I will tell you, there was no floor cleaner than at the end of my shift and no rubbish bin left full. And I carry that with me today in anything that I do. It has to be of that superior quality of work. The second valuable lesson, there were times I would get on the elevator with nurses, doctors, and administrators, not always, but there were times where I was just ignored. It literally meant I did not exist because I'm a janitor and the rest of you have these professions. I know what this feels like. I will never treat people like that. This is why it's been about 5,000 conversations to date because everybody has something that they can share. And the third valuable lesson, in anything that I do in life, rather than focusing on it as a challenge or an obstacle, I will always look at it as an opportunity and a learning experience. So in anything I do, I go in with this curiosity to say, what can I learn from this situation? It made me realize I was not prepared and not ready, but I needed that to help me where I can now help other people in their journey because I've been able to see what the challenges are. But it, that's this, this at the outset of my life in, in a career actually was probably one of the most profound things that happened that has enabled me to do what I get to do right now. As you were getting these rejections and mm -hmm. eventually you... Mm -hmm received the one acceptance and for this position, when did the language start to change for you of mm -hmm. this is, they should be lucky to get me. I may not yeah. get something, but I need to rethink how I think yeah. about what life is in store for me. How did that begin yeah. to change? It, it was through the process in the very beginning, when you send out the letters, I think that's where who's lucky to get me. But like I said, as these letters started to emerge in the beginning, it's, it, it wasn't so bad, but then eventually you're getting more and more rejections and you're, you're asking yourself, but wait a minute, I've got this piece of paper. And my understanding is 
this should be good enough or not good enough. This should be what you need to get into this position. And I think this is where even today when I look at it, and that's why a big chunk of the audience are the 15 to 40 year olds. And this is also what I do in my class is we talk about who you are versus what you're going to do. And I make my students write a personal statement in week two and in week 11. And a personal statement is, tell me who you are, not what you're going to do. If you and I met for the first time, how would you introduce yourself? And make it into a profound statement so that, and, and keep working on this. This isn't just for this class. And what's interesting is I've heard back from students that I've taught, you know, and they're like, that personal statement, it was one of the most difficult exercises I've had to do, but I am revising it and I am working on it because I think it is really important. But yeah, through that process, th these are the things that emerged that I needed to help individuals so they don't have to go through what I went through. There is a word that I've used is, mm -hmm. is a branding statement, but I think yours goes a lot deeper mm -hmm. than that. I, I may have to lift that, Sam. I, I will <laughs> sure. see. When did you begin to have this opportunity inside the, the at the business school in the university? Yeah. Actually, it was interesting because when I went for the interview, I've been at the university now 17 years. 17. And 17. And but the idea was that when I entered, I mean, I took my letters with me, that huge chunk of letters with me. And the associate dean, when we were talking, her idea was, so why here? And why this position? And rather than saying what I was going to do in this position, instead I said, I pulled out the letters and I said, here's what my story is. I don't want our students to go through what I went through. And within 30 minutes, she phoned me and she said, we're not interviewing anyone else. You got the job. And it, the first job actually at the university was engage our students. Now, I can understand and appreciate that the academics is there, you're getting the marks, you're getting the, the theories and everything, but majority of the employers are not asking about, well, what's on your transcript or what mark did you get in these classes? They're asking, show me and demonstrate that you can do this. So I created the student engagement platform and we saw a shift in a culture of disengagement where students were just going home to where students are, are now coming to our school because of the opportunities that we were able to build. And I just remember that, like I said, teaching was never a goal of mine, but I was just out of the, I thought I'm going to work on my master's, you know, let me, let me do this. And as I was working on my master's, then my associate Dean came up, tapped me on the shoulder. He said, well, now you're working on your master's. You do realize you can teach at university. And I thought, oh, and he said, yeah, we'd like to get you into the teaching role now. And you get to be more flexible and adaptable as opposed to that nine to five. My job was never nine to five at the university, by the way. But rather than that structure where you're very organic, now you can actually maybe teach one or two days a week. And then the rest of the time you work on your other projects. And one thing led to another. And Howard, it's interesting because one thing I share with people is, because I get asked, okay, what are your goals? And I said, actually, I have no goals. And they're like, oh my gosh, you're aimless. I said, no, no, I'm not aimless. Instead, I have intentions. And those five things I shared with you earlier, those are my intentions. And for me, and I'm not saying if somebody has goals, they're wrong, but it just never worked for me because I saw goals as absolutes and linear. In other words, you're asked to set a timeline for one year, two years, and what you plan on doing. What if you suddenly get an opportunity that doesn't line up with your goal? Do you give up the goal or the opportunity? It's very absolute. So I look at it as I balance it against those five things. So for example, writing, when writing emerged, that came out of my first TEDx speech that I did. I was never, it was never a goal to be a writer, but once I finished the TEDx con uh, speech, then people were like, you should write a book about storytelling and discovering the extraordinary and the ordinary. And then I looked at it and it just resonated because of those five things. And, and so intentions is where I am as opposed to the goals. Okay. So let's touch on the TEDx. I mean, where in this, this timeline, I mean, again, you, you're, 
lots of great experiences, conversations, impact. It's not, and, and I love the, the framework that I'm not doing any of this necessarily for me, for my impact, but it's to, to make a better world for, for other people. I want to have an impact on others. That's what yes. my sense that I get from this yeah. conversation so far. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about the TEDx's. How did those come about? Yeah, it, it was because once you build that solid brand or, you know, and people are coming to you, both TEDx's, I was approached, they, they basically came to me and said, you know, we really would like you to speak about a topic. And then I had to just share what the topic was, and I had to come up with it. And I, the first one, the TEDx I did, which was on storytelling, discover the extraordinary in the ordinary. My thoughts and idea was the fact that you know, we live in a world that's ordinary every day. Like that's what we perceive it to be. We have our routine, but embedded in the ordinary are these tremendously extraordinary experiences. And the way that I decipher them, which is what I spoke about in my TEDx, is using a concept I came up with, which I call carpe. So carpe diem sees the day, but carpe is how I discover the extraordinary out of the ordinary. Carpe stands for curiosity, appreciation, reflection, perspective, and experience. So as I go through life, my radar is on. I show and demonstrate curiosity. So for example, the example I used in my TEDx was a wooden wedge doorstop. I mean, we've walked into buildings, we've seen the wooden wedge doorstop, but I remember walking into the university and the wooden wedge doorstop was propping the door open and curiosity kicked in. I stopped and I started looking at it. And I started thinking about it. And that's when the appreciation came in because I no longer looked at it as a wooden wedge doorstop. There's something more significant here. And I started appreciating it for more than what it does or what it is. And then I started reflecting, that's the R. And reflection is where we add purpose and meaning to this, anything. And for me, it was adding purpose and meaning to the doorstop. And then our perspectives kick in. So all our history, all of our background, our perceptions adds into the reflection. So curiosity, appreciation, reflection, and perspective. Now, here I am standing at the door, looking at this doorstop. And I'm sure people in the office are like, why is he just standing there? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Is he okay? And then the experience as well, as, and I'll add that in a sec, but that C-A-R-P enabled me to realize that wooden wedge doorstop holds a door open for me. What about the people in my life that have opened and held the door for me? They are my wooden wedge doorstops and they've been critical and instrumental in my life. And it, all of a sudden that doorstop meant so much to me because of the analogy and the parallel. And the E that I talked about is experience. If I don't capture this as a story, my story dies an untimely death. So I catalog everything based on this C-A-R-P-E. And so when I'm sitting there talking to somebody and they're telling me about a situation or they're telling me about their life and experiences, I've got this virtual filing cabinet that I can pull these stories. And it, I find that stories, analogies, and acronyms just seem to really resonate and stick with people. But that's an example of how you can turn something ordinary into the extraordinary. And the second TEDx speech I did was about how do you activate the voice within to be louder than the noise around? And that, the premise of this was about the five core elements and helping individuals maneuver and realize how they can actually understand who they are as opposed to what they do. With all of these, these tools, the techniques, the acronyms and mm -hmm. giving, giving them life, because that's what you're doing. You're, you're giving all these, these yeah. elements life. We are living, and this in some ways may mm -hmm. go off a little bit of a tangent here, but it's sure. dawning on me. We are going through a lot of stuff. Yep. in 2021 we went through a lot of stuff in 2020 mm -hmm. and we're still going to continue to go through stuff yeah whatever that stuff is mm -hmm. those were air quotes to the listening audience 
how mm-hmm. can your message of capturing being in the moment intentional knowing that there's a story here and capturing it don't let it go how can we take you take that kind of a message to your students who are themselves perhaps young enough to not truly appreciate that these are unprecedented times but they're most surely going to be affected by them whether they realize it or not how do we help smooth the way for them to not be overwhelmed by things that are out of their control. Sure. Uh, There's a couple of things that I would share on that is I use a concept and that's with individuals, teams, organizations, educational institutions, and nonprofits. Howard, we've gone through a lot. We are still going through a lot and we will go through a lot. Every single person in this world has been impacted by COVID, the pandemic. A way that I maneuver and to support, whether it's in my classroom or consulting or anything we do, I use this acronym of CARE. There is a need for us to care right now. And what CARE stands for is collaboration, adaptability, resilience, and empathy. I always say collaboration. What is it that I have and what is it that you have or anybody that we need to share with each other. We all have our own strengths and we need to support each other. So we need to collaborate. Adaptability is going in with this mindset of possibilities and opportunities, not challenges and obstacles. Adaptability means, are you able to function and change and pivot and not be afraid of having to go down this pathway? Resilience is, Understanding this is not over tomorrow, next week, next month, maybe even next year. We're in a marathon. So you have to build this resiliency into your life. And finally, empathy. Empathy is showing care and compassion to each other because we don't know what people are going through and they've gone through a lot. So try to be more understanding, more caring, more empathetic towards each other. And the other part I will add to care is, and I think I've always done this in my life, is when situations emerge that are beyond my control, I don't allow the situation to dictate how I'm going to react. I will dictate how I'm going to react to the situation. For example, today in Vancouver, we had a tremendous downpour of rain. You know what, Howard? I can't change the weather, but I dressed appropriately. And I look at it as, okay, but what can I do as opposed to, ah, here's the things I can't do. So I think that's a mindset also that's important is having the individual realize instead of having the environment and the situation control you, you control how you're going to react to the situation. We all have choices how we show up. Mm-hmm. And I love the this, this analogy. <laughs> And your acronyms are just amazing, by the way. So thank you <laughs> thank for you, that. Man. Of course, I'm going to have to go back through the notes and sp- get those all spelled out in, in the show notes. So thank you for that too, Sam. No. But as you look back at your journey, mm-hmm. are there any surprises for you? Every day. I think because I'm so curious, there's always surprises. And I think what it is, is it made me realize that I thrive in ambiguity and uncertainty. I know that many people fear it, but that's where the magic happens. And I thrive in that zone. And equally at the same time, I've had obstacles. I've had setbacks. But it comes to one of my favorite sayings is, obstacles are the necessary bricks on a road to success. I don't fear the obstacles. I've learned from my obstacles. They've made me stronger as an individual. And I've, you know, had the support of people around me, but obstacles are the necessary bricks on a road to success. Uh, Your life will not be just full of unicorns, rainbows, and cotton candy clouds, but equally, I've learned so much from my setbacks. You know, I'm I'm curious, and and Mm -hmm. If this is getting personal, you let me know. Feel free. No, to no, push back. there's no, there's, there's no uh, boundaries here. So go ahead and ask. <laughs> Before we started the call, you had mentioned obviously the your, your wife, who's who's 
mm -hmm. you know, given you your chores to do, or if you're getting too out of hand, just go to your office mm -hmm. and work and yep. you've got your boys. How do they appreciate the dad's view? You've got a, you've got a very interesting worldview. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because my wife and I are totally different. She loves structure. She loves the nine to five and at 5 PM, everything shuts down and she can resume her family life. And she wants to work Monday to Friday. She doesn't want to work Saturdays or Sundays. And for me, I'm the, opt I mean, whether it's Monday, Friday, Sunday, Thursday, it's a day of the week and every day is unique to me. But that's also enabled me to spend more time at home with the boys. It's uh, enabled me to be very flexible. And there are some days that are eight in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, but they're not frequent and they don't happen every day. But when they do happen, they know that the next two days, I'll probably just be home hanging out, uh, working at my office, maybe going to throw the football around with my son or play shoot basketball with the other one. So it's very flexible in that regard. So for me, the flexibility is very important, but I think we have some common ground, but also we have some spaces that are very unique and distinct. Yeah, because you actually live in the gray zone. Mm -hmm. You know, this gray area, like you described your wife, are very yep. much cut and dry. Very interesting. And it, and there goes to show oh, opposites attract, or I most certainly don't want to be dating somebody or marry somebody just like me. That would just not work at all. Uh, well, and no, and I think what happens though is eventually the realization, because I told my wife if I, because she would love for me to go back to corporate, but she so also realizes that's not where I'm meant to be. I told her, I said, if, if corporate is where I'm supposed to go, because that's what you want, make sure you take a very healthy life insurance on my life because I will die. Right. <laughs> I remember using that term. In fact, it was in Victoria. For our listeners, Sam and I were chatting beforehand and when I found out he lived in, in Vancouver and I spent some time in Victoria, British Columbia. And I remember waking up and realizing I didn't want to die alone in a hotel room. And I was in the most beautiful place in the world. So how can that possibly happen? That's why I got out of corporate America. It's, it's not for me. I've got a question and I want to touch on with your book, Lost and Found, Seeking the Past and Finding Myself. How did that book come about? Well, it, it was one of those things that was always within me. And when I wrote my first book on personal storytelling, part of what I wrote in that was about my journey to find my ancestral roots with a faded photograph, very little information. But I also ch had a challenging upbringing, not in a, in a way that my parents were mean or anything. It was more of just that whole aspect that I never really appreciated or understood my cultural identity. So I was born in England raised in Canada. My parents come from Fiji Islands, which is near Australia. And my grandfathers come from India. And physically, if you were to see me, you know, I, I resemble South Asian or Indian. And I always get asked, what part of India are you from? And I would be like, well, I was born in England, raised in Canada. They're like, no, no, no. What part of India are your parents from? Well, my parents are from Fiji Islands near Australia. And they're like, wait, are you Indian? So we always struggle with this identity piece because, and, and the other part is they'd be like, well, no, you're not Indian, you're Canadian, whatever that might be. Or the other response is, no, no, really, where are you from? And I'm like, I just, how do I answer that? So I struggled with this identity piece. And I, I think when I got to university and a much more global audience or students, it suddenly helped me to realize that that's a part of my life that was missing. But also, my grandfather left India when he was like 17 years old, 1905, ventured off to new adventures. And, but nobody knew where the village was. So with this faded photograph, very little information. And it was interesting. There was a lot of noise on, you won't find it. Why are you looking? You might get a bad reception, if, even if you find it. But it made me realize I was a foreigner going to a land that shouldn't be foreign to me searching for a needle in a haystack and not knowing where the haystack was. It's a beautiful story because it's seen through the eyes of somebody who's trying to explore their ancestral roots, but also their own personal identity. And 
I did capture my personal identity in the sense that my life was always a, a platter, an Indian dish called a tali, segmented into British, Canadian, Fijian, and Indian. And I mean, I played in an Irish military pipe band, so there's a bit of Irish chutney on the side, <laughs> but everything was segmented. By going to India, I had an epiphany, which was, I'm not a tali, I'm a rice dish called kichardi, which is a blend of flavors. And I think all of us are kichardi. It's like an omelet. And that was my realization on finding myself. And by some strange coincidence and circumstances, after many setbacks, I actually did find my grandfather's house. And I went to the field, scooped up dirt, brought the dirt home to the family so that they know that this is where our ancestors came from. But the journey, even though it's a story, I've told you the end of the story that I did find the village. It's the journey that's the most beautiful part of this book. That's fantastic. And, and as you were sharing that, I was thinking the, the word tapestry was coming to mind. Yep. yep. And made up of different, yeah. different pieces. I, I love it. I love it. Sam, going forward, I mean, with your work, mm -hmm. your passion, I somehow feel you're going to be building the airplane as you fly it, as opposed to a destination. What are your, what's your perspective going oh, looking forward? Truly, truly. I mean, it, I think if, as long as I've got those five core elements with me and they may change over the years, those are, that's my compass. That's guiding me to the things that I will be doing in the future as well. But right now I'm really enjoying all the things I'm working on, whether it's related or unrelated. I picked up woodworking last year and can't stop. And now I'm getting these orders and uh, fulfilling the orders. But the thing that's interesting about the woodworking, Howard, is uh, when I'm out in my garage working on a project like building a desk or you know making uh, charcuterie boards or a bathtub caddy, I have freed myself from my commitments for two, three, four hours. And some of my best ideas are coming. And I highly recommend people find their outlet, whether it's cooking, yoga, walking, anything that just engages you. All of a sudden, it frees your mind. And you're able to come up with pretty much either new ideas or solving your problems. I love it. And, and I can totally empathize with that. For me, here in Las Vegas, it's the desert. It's the stars, the, the Milky Way. And it's just... Yeah. Take pictures, sit down and just go, ah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go? Yeah. So you can go to my website, which is www.sam-thiara, T-H-I-A-R-A.com. And I've got about 180 blog posts about life and career. And a lot of what I've shared is there and it's all free. Also where my book is available. I'm also on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So you can always find me there as well. Fantastic. Well, we will most definitely provide links back to the website. And definitely, folks, check out Sam's blog. It's amazing, as well as his social sites of Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Sam, it's a pleasure to connect with you, meet you. We met through our friends at Podmatch and uh I mean, I'm always up for a good conversation. There's a lot of folks out there I can grow your business to 10x and to do online success. But it's frankly, it's these kind of stories that really kind of resonate for me the most. So truly appreciate it. And I'm grateful that you are taking the time to join me today. Oh, no, Howard, thank you. And it's one of those things of building those relationships, connectedness and things like that. I mean, I always say that everyone's life is an autobiography. Make yours worth reading. We are all living stories. We all have something to share. And don't be afraid to share your stories. Most definitely that. And, and, I, and I have to also share part of my brain. I'm focusing. I'm, I'm totally in for this interview, okay? But part of my brain is figuring out how do I get to Vancouver? And by the <laughs> way, my friend lives in Abbotsford. I knew that was... That that's was working it. in the back too. No, and I do know about Abbotsford and that's a bit further out than the words we were using for trying to find the places. But yes, by all, by all means, Abbotsford is a beautiful community. Yeah, and I definitely could see getting back to, to Victoria and then on to, to Vancouver. Yeah. So we will break bread, have a cup of coffee, a tea, and I'd love to do that when everything opens back up. 
Sounds good, Howard. All the best. Very good. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with Sam Thiara. He is a speaker, a storyteller, educator, entrepreneur, founder, and chief motivating officer at Ignite the Dream Coaching and Consulting, and the author of Lost and Found, Seeking the Past and Finding Myself. Really some wonderful nuggets of gold here in today's episode, and we will do our best not only to bring, give you this wonderful show notes, but also to bring to life a lot of these acronyms that, that Sam was sharing today. So you won't have, to, and we definitely want you to listen to the podcast episode and give us your likes, your comments, but we'll also uh, provide some of the, the more detailed elements of today's conversation with Sam. Do go out and visit him on his website at sam theara.com And we'll also provide those backlinks as well as to his Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. If you'd like this episode, we want to hear you, what you thought, okay? So give us a like, give us a comment. You can find us on successinsightpodcast.com. We are on Facebook and on LinkedIn, Success Insight Podcast, as well as the major podcasting platforms, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Audible, Pandora, iHeartRadio, and of course, Spotify, where we will have this episode organized in our series, the Coaching and Consulting Insight Series. And so do check us out there as well. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. We'll see you on another episode of Coaching and Consulting Insights, as well as on the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.